All right, so today, um, just our housekeeping slide here, we wanna let everybody know that we are um, developing specifically for, for professional development. We have a new listserv that is being created um, so that we can help y'all um, in collaborating and working specifically on professional development. So we will be sending more information out on that soon. Um, so next slide. So today's Family Medicine Grand Rounds, February 24th. Um, the event ID is 55047. You can register for your CME credit through your cell phone, your smartphone, or on the computer. Please remember to register by midnight if you're wanting to receive CME credit. And we want to thank you for muting your microphone as we begin, also being attentive to the presenter being engaged and also at the very end, I will be putting in the chat box the information to complete and submit the um, evaluation form so we can give Dr. Reyes feedback. So this is a South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds and we are partnered with the South Central AHEC. Next slide. And CME transcripts are available at the CME office's website. If you have any questions, please feel free to email them, call them, or you can also email me. We also offer AAFP credit for those who are members. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact the AAFP uh, through phone numbers listed there um, through the email, or you may also um, email me as well. So there is um, no conflict of interest. Dr. Reyes and Dr. Wimers have no relevant financial interests with commercial interests to disclose. And today we have Dr. Arlene Reyes and her faculty preceptor, Dr. Marcy Wimers. Um, they are going to be presenting, Dr. Reyes will present for us the top poems of 2019 for pain relief, lower doses of ibuprofen work as well as higher doses. So I will let her go ahead and begin. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, hi, everybody. So welcome to our Grand Rounds today. Um, as Nicole mentioned, we're going to be talking about one of the top poems of 2019. Um, the title here is pretty um, self-explanatory, um, but I'm excited to talk to you guys about it. Hopefully, as with other poems, um, you guys get to take away something from today that'll help you um, provide better, safer care for your patients. Um, and so with that said, we'll just jump right into it. Um, so here are the obje objectives. Um, just briefly, we'll talk about how ibuprofen is used in patient outpatient, um, more specifically on the outpatient setting. Um, we'll talk about the analgesic efficacy of the three most common ibuprofen doses. And uh, we'll talk about what this study um, that is discussed with this poem adds to our knowledge and how we can incorporate that into our clinical practice. So before I get started, um, I thought it would be a good idea to just kind of review for those who are unfamiliar or want a refresher, um, what is POEMS, what does it stand for? Um, basically stands for patient-oriented evidence that matters. And, and it's an annual summary of research that the AFP has puts together. Um, and it's regarding research that's relevant to physicians and their patients and meets three specific criteria. I think these three specific criteria are really important um, when we're talking about how this will change our um, clinical practice. So it addresses a question that primary care physicians face day-to-day -day practice, measures outcomes that are important to physicians and to patients, um, including symptoms, morbidity, quality of life, and mortality. Um, and has the potential to change the way uh, we practice medicine. Um, and I just wanna kind of point out here, poems in the name is specifically describes patient-oriented evidence. Um, and I think that's really important to note um, because that's different from disease-oriented evidence. Um, and I kind of outline here what the difference is. So patient-oriented evidence tells clinicians that a diagnostic, therapeutic, or preventive procedure helps patients live longer, so we're talking about mortality, um, or live better, um, which is morbidity. Disease-oriented evidence is a little bit different. 
So it's research that focuses on either intermediate or surrogate outcomes, not necessarily specifically morbidity or mortality. Um, and currently a lot of our medicine and how we practice is based on disease oriented evidence, not necessarily patients oriented evidence. And so I have on the next slide, um, some examples of what that looks like um, and some research. So on the left, you'll see the study. So that found, so three different studies, one that found that blood pressure, uh, you can blood pressure, lower your blood pressure with doxazosin. Um, the disease-oriented or evidence is that blood pressure is lowered, but the patient-oriented evidence is that it increased heart failure, right? So we want to take into account um, the, the risks and benefits and the actual outcomes um, that we find in our patients whenever we're talking about um, treatments or um, procedures. Um, the next one I have there is tumor response and drug treatment. So you may see reduction of elimination of a tumor, but in the end, you might not even see an effect on survival, which is important, something we consider um, when we're talking about taking care of patients. Um, and then the last one, just talking about postmenopausal osteoporosis treatment with fluoride therapy. We saw an increased bone mineral density, but it increases non-vertebral fractures. So something we may not wanna do, even though the disease-oriented evidence shows that it increases bone density, right? Um, so those are the important differences. And if you guys have any questions during the um, presentation. Um, feel free to type in the chat. Nicole will keep an eye on it. And this is kind of a short presentation, honestly. Um, so we do have time for questions like in, during the presentation. Okay. So um, the title of the study that this poem discusses is comparison of oral ibuprofen at three single dose regimens for treating acute pain in the emergency, emergency department. It's a randomized controlled tri trial. Um, the clinical question. So what they were asking was, do ibuprofen doses of 600 or 800 milligrams improve analgesia relative to 400 milligrams in the emergency department patients with a variety of acute pain syndromes? In other words, um, do higher doses of ibuprofen provide more effective analgesia than lower doses? Um, and so they hypothesized um, that lower dose 400 milligrams versus the higher dose 600, 800 milligrams um, would actually provide comparable analgesia um, and, and compared to the, the higher doses. Um, and so essentially, you know, we're talking about research, the null hypothesis, hypothesis for this study would be um, what we generally think, which is higher doses of, of ibuprofen provide better analgesia. A lot of times in the ED, um, you see 800 milligrams um, being prescribed all the time, even in clinic um, for acute pain. And so the research team set out to basically disprove um, that notion. And so why is this important? Um, we, like I mentioned, we know that the higher doses of ibuprofen are commonly prescribed. Um, and there's actually a, um, a known dosing threshold for ibuprofen. Um, that is actually lower than what are some of these doses that we typically prescribe. And as we know, ibuprofen with higher doses and extended use can potentially cause risk of harm. Um, there, the study had referenced a prior meta-analysis evaluating GI complications, which is a commonly known um, um, side effect of, of NSAIDs. And what I thought was interesting, or I didn't realize was the actual um, statis statistics of the, the side effects. And so I listed here um, just a few. So ibuprofen had lowest odds ratio at doses less than or equal to 1200 milligrams per day. Um, the odds ratio of having a GI complication doubled at doses greater than or equal to 800 milligrams per day. And the relative risk of cardiovascular adverse effects doubles with doses above 1200 milligrams today. And I felt uh, per day, and I felt like that was important to put in here because um, we easily prescribe doses much higher than that in a 24 hour period. Um, they also had commented on data from dental oral surgery literature that supported analgesic sealing dose of 400 milligrams per dose, which is a max um, of 
1200 in a day. And um, I went ahead and I actually looked up, you know, what is the FDA approved dosing? And actually this is lower than the FDA approved dosing, which is 400 to 600 every four to six hours, which is a max of 3200, which is what we call prescription strength. Um, so a little bit of background. Motrin um, is one of the most commonly used oral analgesics in outpatient and patient clinical settings. It's a non-selective, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, we know that it reversibly inhibits COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, blocks the synthesis of prostaglandins and thromboxanes, which um, lead to the symptoms of inflammation and pain that we experience. Um, it's used to treat mild and moderate pain as a single analgesic or in combination with Tylenol and for severe pain can be used in combination with opioid analgesics. And so here's just kind of a quick flow that shows, um, if this takes you back to med school, I'm sorry, um, but just a quick review of, um, of where NSAIDs act, or actually specifically ibuprofen, and so you'll see the red X there, um, kind of inhibiting the COX-1 and COX-2. So it's widely used in the emergency room, also in clinic for acute pain, like MSK pain, dental headaches, and dysmenorrhea. Half-life is two to two and a half hours. It's metabolized in the liver, eliminated in the kidneys, and um, there are multiple drug-drug interactions that we are familiar with. So um, com combined with aspirin, we know that it can actually cause the loss of the cardioprotective function of aspirin, antagonizes the irreversible uh, platelet inhibition that we see with aspirin. Um, combined with warf warf morphin, we can see worsening GI hemorrhage. Combined with steroids, we can see that it leads to, it can lead to peptic ulcer disease. And in combination with diuretics or ACE inhibitors, you may see elevated systolic pressures, worsening renal function, and for those who are on lithium, increased toxicity. Um, so the study was a randomized controlled double blind trial um, in the setting of the emergency department. Their inclusion criteria, they um, enrolled patients who were 18 and older presented with acute pain and warranted oral ibuprofen. And then the exclusion criteria, there was, they were pretty specific. So they avoided enrolling patients with known PUD, peptic ulcer disease, GI hemorrhage, renal hepatic insufficiency, allergies to NSAIDs, altered mental status, use of op opioid or NSAID use within four hours before they arrived at the ED, and they also excluded pregnant and breastfeeding patients. Um, the screening and the enrollment was done during hours when their ED pharmacist was available to allow for blinded medication preparation, and that's gonna be important when we talk about the limitations um, further down. So um, the participants were allocated to three groups. They were randomized to um, the group that would get 400 milligrams, the group that would get 600, and the group that would get 800. Um, and then the ED providers, the study participants, the research investigators, they were all blinded to the medication that the patients received. Um, and so the data that was collected, so they did, um, they collected pain scores um, using the numeric rating scale zero to 10 um, at baseline before they got medicine and then at 60 minutes. Um, and then they also collected the rates of rescue medication that was given. So basically for those patients who at 60 minutes who were still having significant pain, um, they collected data on who received more medication after that. Um, and then their goal was to um, record any adverse effects at baseline in 60 minutes. So outcome measures, the primary outcome was um, observing the difference in the mean pain scores between each of the groups at 60 minutes. And then their secondary outcomes kind of mentioned both in the slide before. So they were comparing um, rates of adverse events need for rescue analgesia at 60 minutes, and then comparing the mean pain score differences, differences in each group from baseline to 60. Um, so they used statistical software. This is kind of a wordy slide, but I kind of, I want you to turn your attention down to the second to last bullet, um, which for me, and then the last bullet, which is I think the two most important things that 
um, they determined that a clinically significant difference in pain score would be um, a drop of at least 1.3 points between the three groups and assumed a standard deviation of three. And then they determined that they would need at least 69 subjects per group um, to, to get at least an 80% power and, um, and um, a significance level of 0 .5, 0 0.05 or 5%. Okay, so um, in the end, they ended up enrolling and, and I'll just point out, they actually, purposefully enrolled 75 patients, not 69. Um, so 75 patients per group um, to account for the possibility of patients dropping out of this study. Um, for whatever reason, you know, some patients were discharged early. Um, and so just to kind of cover their bases and make sure that they had a, a, a significantly, a statistically significant study they made sure to enroll more than what was needed. So they enrolled a total of 225 subjects. Um, in the end, at 60 minutes, they had 223. So from the 600 milligram group and the 800 milligram group, they each had one patient who would dropped off. Between the groups, the characteristics were pretty similar in age, sex, and initial pain score. Um, and then the, the Conditions that were treated were primarily sprains, strains, fractures, and cutaneous pain. Um, any questions so far? Okay, keep going. So um, table two. So basically I put this here. It, it shows the pain scores for all groups over time. So if you look at the shaded um, top portion, those are the baseline pain scores for the patients who got 400, 600, 800 milligrams. The mean pain score was uh, slightly above six for each group. And then at 60 minutes, which is the category below in white um, for each group, the mean pain score was about a little over five. I mean, a little over four. Um, and so over here on the left, I specified what the difference was from baseline to 60 minutes. So for the 400 milligram group, the change in pain score was there was a drop of about 2.12 points. Um, for 600, there was a drop in 1.85 points and 800 milligrams, there was a drop in 1.95 points. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone, they determined that there would need to be at least a drop of 1.3 for clinical significance. And so these were all about that. Um, here is a box plot that kind of just that shows us, you know, the overall characteristics and um, data from from the group of patients that were enrolled. Um, the left side is time zero or baseline before they got medication. The right side is sixty minutes. And I I feel like the big takeaway for this um, is if you look at the boxes. Um, on the left, they're all around or a little above six, um, pretty similar. There's a couple outliers. So the open circles that you see, for example, um, in the purple or blue um, color, which is the 400 milligram group, there's a few outliers there. Um, and then on the right as well, but you'll see that um, at baseline, the mean pain scores were about the same. And then at 60 minutes, they all like significantly dropped all about the same as well. And so this is just kind of a pictograph of that explaining the previous or showing what the previous slide with the table was showing. Um, they also, oops, I think I went back. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure why I'm going backwards. Hang on guys, sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so they also compared, this is another table just showing the difference in mean pain scores between each group. So the difference between 400 and 600 at baseline 400 and 800 and 600 and 800 at baseline. And then they did the same thing at 60 minutes and it showed there was no clinically meaningful, meaningful 
difference in the mean scores um, between the three dose groups. Same thing here, they went even further and divided the groups into pains scores rated less than five, equal to or less than five, and then equal to or greater than six. And there wasn't a clinically meaningful difference in those groups either. Um, so we'll talk about what all this means. And um, basically what they found was that there was a similar decrease in pain scores for all three dosages. Um, there was a similar analgesic efficacy for 400, 600, and 800 for the short-term treatment of moderate to severe acute pain in the ED. Um, some of the limited, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit um, after we talk about the limitations in our discussion. Um, but some of the limitations, they had noted possibility of selection bias just because um, the, their ED pharmacist was only available during daytime hours. And so they did not enroll any patients overnight. Um, so they may have missed out on patients that would have otherwise been enrolled if they had a pharmacist overnight. Um, <clears throat> other limitation was they couldn't assess for safety just because of the short duration. Um, and so they weren't able to assess the variance in safety between the three doses. 60 minutes is just a short amount of time. Um, and also they weren't able to assess adverse effect profiles because the patients were discharged typically after their pain had improved um, if they didn't require any admission and, um, and there was no follow-up after they left the emergency room. The other um, limitations were um, they couldn't assess, so they had discussed um, that there may have been differences in um, analgesia if they were able to observe patients for longer, so up to four to six hours, we may have seen that maybe they had a longer effect, therapeutic effect for the higher doses, but they couldn't assess that because they stopped after 60 minutes. Um, and they chose the 60 minute time frame because this is typically what they do in the ED. You know, they give a medication hour later, they reassess, and if patients improve, they send them home. Um, so, what does all this mean? Um, I feel like it's kind of repetitive. I probably have been saying the same thing in many different ways. Um, but just to sum it up, basically, similar change in pain score between the lower dose compared to the higher dose. Um, and there, there was at least a two point change in um, the 400 milligram dosing group, which is significantly larger than the cutoff that we had mentioned before, which was 1.3 points. Um, the only difference would, if anything, may be the duration of analgesia, like I mentioned earlier, but they weren't able to follow that. And we do know that NSAIDs follow a linear kinetic pattern. So the, the higher the dose, probably the longer the effect. Um, but we were really, this group, this research study was really focusing on acute pain. Um, they did comment um, even that there was some literature that showed even for chronic pain like osteoarthritis, lower doses are similar in efficacy, um, but there's not much, um, there's not much studies available um, looking into that and probably we could use some more to evaluate that further. Um, whoops, went backwards again, sorry. And so, um, I think the big takeaway for this study and this poem is we know that single doses are not likely of ibuprofen are not likely to cause much harm. We know that chronically um, dosed ibuprofen increases the risk of possible side effects. And I think what we all can attest to if we have experience in the emergency room or even in the clinic um, prescribing medication, ibuprofen for the patients to take home is for their chronic pain or, you know, their acute pain. Um, ED providers may even send them home with like, you know, two weeks of the 800 milligram dosing. Um, and I think that this study shows that maybe they don't need 
the two weeks of 800 milligrams, maybe it would be just as effective sending them home with 400 milligrams. Um, and, and we could potentially be, you know, avoiding serious adverse effects um, by prescribing them the lower doses. We do have a question here. It says, um, yeah. could there be any placebo effect? So that's an interesting question. Um, they, so because this, this trial was a randomized controlled double blind study. So these patients didn't know what they were getting. Um, they did comment on a study um, for injectable um, steroids like Toradol versus oral, I'm sorry, I said injectable steroids, <laughs> um, injectable NSAIDs like Toradol versus oral NSAIDs. Um, and they commented that there's this um, thought that maybe there's a placebo effect in um, the study that they had discussed um, showed that not likely there's a, there's a placebo effect, um, but there's, regarding this study specifically, because it was double bind um, and, and randomized, likely it's not a placebo effect. They didn't know what they were getting. So that's what makes this study so strong, I would say. Okay, this is uh, Dave Cotterdahl. So the placebo effect would be important in this study if the three preparations were somehow visibly different or the patient could tell that there was a difference in some way. But if, if they appear, taste, everything is similar, there's no way a placebo effect would account for the differences they saw. Yeah, and the, that's a good point. Thanks, Dr. K. Um, they actually did comment on how the medication was prepared, and they specifically said um, it was prepared the same way um, for each dose, um, even down to like the flavor. So the, but the question is, if there was an arm of the study with zero milligrams, would you get that same effect that you got in the three groups? Hmm. You're right. That, that was not tested, but my guess is yeah. the assumption was prior studies have showed ibuprofen does reduce pain. And so the, that was a question that's previously been answered, and that's probably why they didn't add another arm. Yeah, I understand. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions so far, Nicole? <clears throat> I don't see any others, just some comments about um, similar to a green and from what it looks like the placebo effect was not controlled or measured. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Um, so I think this is this might be my last slide actually. Um, so basically the hope was that knowing that the effects of treating this acute pain um, were similar across the board, that hopefully when you're giving prescriptions um, for patients to take home that you consider maybe giving the lower dose. Um, and so just to summarize, um, I wanna make sure everyone takes away a clear picture of what we talked about today. Um, so many advocate for ibuprofen doses greater than 400, assuming a greater effect. The question for this study was, are higher doses actually more effective? And what it added to our knowledge was that there was actually a similar decrease between the three doses, including the lower one. Um, and, and what we can take away from this is that um, we might wanna consider giving the lower dose, knowing that there's adverse effects potentially with higher doses, um, knowing that there's a, especially for acute pain, right? This is a study that, that focused on acute pain, um, knowing that that the effects were pretty similar across the board. Um, okay, yeah, these are my references and can open it up for questions if there's any. If anybody has questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat box as well. Thanks, Arlene. I think it's an uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, study. And I think, um, you know, for a lot of our patients who already have pre-existing kidney disease, the idea that you still might, might be getting a good effect with, um, 
the moderate doses is reassuring. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's one of those things where you go back to shared patient decision making. We know that many of the complications are dose dependent. So if we discuss this with our patients, you can always take another pill, but you can't take a pill away, right? And so, you know, we can kind of do shared patient decision making to try to decrease complications, but we're not taking anything away from them. They can always increase the dosage, but, you know, a lot of people just start with a higher dosage um, for fear of the pain, and that's where BHC can probably help us too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I didn't mention, um, which reminds me, um, your comment reminds me, um, they had mentioned in this study that four patients from the 400 milligram category and four from the 800 milligram required um, rescue analgesia. So they got a combination of like lighter derm patch um, or another um, like Tylenol or something to help them um, because they likely felt like their pain wasn't controlled. And I think it came out to just, it was like 5% of the total group um, from the 400 and the 800 that needed more medication. But you bring up a good point, Dr. Reimers, you can always give more, but you can't take it away. So, thanks. Any other questions or comments? I would just be curious as to if they did another study and rechecked them X amount of hours later, if there would be a difference in the duration of analgesia between the different groups. Yeah, um, that's something I would be interested in seeing as well. Um, and so maybe that would be a study better for like maybe clinical setting, I don't know, inpatient setting probably because they've got the patients there for longer. Um, it's just difficult for them to do it in the ED. Anything else? Thanks, Arlene. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, guys. With that, I just want to say thank you as well um, to everybody who's attended. I did put the evaluation link in our chat box. Um, if some of you joined late and you're still interested in seeing the complete presentation, we will be putting the recording up on our website. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Reyes, for presenting for us today. No problem. It was a pleasure. Everyone have a good day. Take care.